Da, 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 da. Okay, all right, we're doing this. We're doing this. Okay, guys, um, I'm really excited. I I prepared some material for tonight, for today. I just have a lot of really stuff to say. But before we get into it, let us just take a big deep breath. Oh, all right, I've got to do some stretches, you know. Okay. Let's take a big deep breath together on the count of three. One, two, three. Take in all of that. Oh, sorry, okay. Take on all of that oxygen and we're going to hold it in. And then we're going to let it mix with our own yummy goodness. And then we're going to release our yummy goodness back out into the universe. Okay. On the count of three. One, two, three. Big deep breath in. And hold and just let it mix with all of our own yummy goodness. And then we're going to let it all back out into the universe. Alrighty. Um, I prepared some material for tonight because I wanted to make sure I said some specific things. Uh, we're, I'm going to be taking a break until about November 3rd. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Lovejoy. Love be good. And let's live life together. Uh, okay. If this is your first time here with me, congratulations. You made it. You got front row seats. I'm so happy to have you. This is where I live right here in this little box. And then sometimes I visit other locations on my main YouTube channel, Lovejoy, Love be good. And my retirement plan slash alter ego, Lady Tamora, who I adore. She is amazing and stunning. Um, and I just can't wait to be stable and bring her into existence. Um, okay. Uh, I do want to take a brief moment to say that I sat here and wrote all this out before today's filming. Doing this live it has been a really, really interesting challenge for me. Honestly, it's been... Uh, this is improv now. Um, I'm not good. Well, uh, but it's been a fun challenge of like building consistency for myself in my life, but also of just not like not being afraid to be myself or to censor myself because I'm here live and I can't edit anything out. Um, so that's just been a really interesting challenge. Uh, Okay, so it's been a really interesting challenge for me because I've never felt comfortable with improv. I'm an autistic musical theater person trapped at my home, at home, you know? Like I'm not on stage, I'm here at home. I need a script um, and I love a good song and a good dance number. Uh, and not only am I autistic, I also deal with chronic pain from multiple outdoor adventure accidents when I was a child uh, and that I have slowly learned to take care of and care for myself in those. Um, and the, truly, the only reason I am still alive is because of Spirit's unconditional love and strength that has carried me through this whole time. And in time, I have learned to care for myself and what that all means. I have to be very careful to protect my energy as I require so much care, it takes all of me to keep myself alive. And learning what I truly need in life has slowly, over the last couple years, uh, I've not only managed to cobble together a life where I can survive, but every day I'm getting closer and closer to like a beautiful thriving life where I'm getting to like, I'm, I'm doing these things. This is me thriving. Like I'm not trapped in Barnes and Noble or Starbucks right now. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be here to do. You know, like I'm thriving. I can't take this away from myself now. Um, and so further in the description, there are 800 million links of all the ways you can help not only me, but also all of my wonderful fellow neuroqueer besties out there thrive. So thank you so much for your help, love, and care. Now, normally, I just get into the readings because, you know, this isn't about me. No, this isn't supposed to be about me. This is supposed to be about knowledge. I'll talk more about it in a minute, but this is supposed to be about knowledge. We need to protect the knowledge of the past so that it doesn't repeat in the future. But more on that later. There are two other books that I've already read here for you. Um, if you want to listen to them, they're available. The first one is Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Uh, I chose this book as the first one because this is the book that brought me back to life. I read it in 2020 and I highly recommend it. The second book is Queer Magic by Thomas Prower. And I chose this book as my second book to read on this channel because this is the book that reminded me of why life is worth living. So those are two very important things, especially because I have spent the majority of my life not wanting to be alive. I'm pretty miserable. I hate it here. I think, I mean, it's beautiful. I think we have a lot of potential, but like, dear God, the last 10 to 12 years were like such a nightmare and I don't think I don't think the nightmare is quite over yet I don't know maybe we can transmute our dreams and turn it I mean, I'm not good at changing my okay this is a weird tangent um I don't know where I was going with that but anyway um so those are books that are very important to me I recommend listening to them if you feel like it or put them on for your pets that would really help my channel a lot too. If you just want to play my stuff on in the background while you leave your house for your pets, I'm sure they would love to hear my human voice. Um, okay. Now, before we get into the rest of the work, the readings for the day, I do want to, um, oh my God, hello, Catherine. I love you. Oh, we love a good tangent. Thank you. I love you. Um, 
uh okay uh so this is something you know i mentioned yesterday i think yesterday's video maybe the day before i'm i'm shifting i'm transmuting we're we're changing it up over here um and it's spooky season <laughs> and for some reason y'all guys are freaks and you love pain so we're gonna focus on that for a minute um and just a content warning this could trigger an emotional response of you and if you need to protect yourself and skip it please skip it this is also live it's not gonna be bad um uh, it's just yeah, i'm just giving a content warning um I'm gonna stand up, and when you see me stand up, if, if you're watching this in the future, then it's safe again. Um, oh, I love you, Tiffany. Thank you. Tiffany's amazing. Tiffany's my mama. Um, not my mama mama, but like my TikTok mama. Anyway, I just posted a video about how much I love her today. Um, okay. <sighs> right, so I'm gonna stand up when it's done, so that way as a visual trigger to you, or you can mute me if you want. Um, that's probably if you're watching it live, you can meet me, but I'm going to stand up as a visual trigger to you that it's a safe space again. Okay. So this is my pain acknowledgement section. Um, and so, okay. So I'd like to invite you to give yourself a big old hug and acknowledge the pain that you might be currently feeling and experiencing in your body. For me right now in this moment, I am currently experiencing pain in my left hip. I think shifting my leg, no, not really. Shifting my leg helped a little bit, but I am currently experiencing pain in my left hip. Um, and I am also currently sitting, sleeping, and working on the bloodied land of the Coastal Salish people, specific, specifically the Paiulup, I'm trying to say that right, I apologize deeply. Paiulup, Paiulup, and Nisqually tribes. Uh, and time is irrelevant. I want to take a moment to focus all of our attention to the women's liberation revolution that is currently going on in Iran. We and we're experiencing one here too in America. It's much more covert and secretive, and not being bloodied, murdered in the streets. But maybe, praise, who knows what their timeline is? You know. So anyway, we women will be victorious. We will prevail in the end. It is the only option. And so now I am sending all of my love, all of my strength, all of my protection to every woman out there who is rising up and fighting and sacrificing everything for their future daughter's lives. The goddess is with us and we have already won. There is a force out there that is suppressing information. And I did a ton of Googling this afternoon to try to find links talking about it. And eventually the only thing I could include was a TikTok that I saw this morning. So those links are in the description right now. And if you've made it this far, thank you. Um, I'm going to be real honest right now. I don't really know how long my channel will be able to stay up because like, I don't know if what I'm doing is, is copyright infringement. I'm trying to transmute it so that way I can argue that it isn't. But I'm also really trying to share information with you guys that is being suppressed. Um, and I want to be a source to reveal information like a digital library, of, if you will, of what I think is important for my people, my beautiful, strong, courageous, neuroqueer, fey people. Uh, fey alien mystery people and ultimately everyone in the universe to know I think that this is essential information I'm an Aquarius if information is very important to me um, and friendship and community I'm and then also in this pain acknowledgement um, I am speaking the name of Helen Amadi she's a young girl she's seven years she's seven years old she was brutally beaten yesterday uh, for protesting and refusing to wear a hijab um, and she died of internal bruise uh, bleeding and the only information that's being released is that she was shot. So I hold her pain and I hold all this pain and I thank this pain for protecting me. And I tell myself that I am protected and I will keep myself safe. I absorb this pain, I transmute it to pleasure and I release it back out into the universe. I really wanna incorporate more of what I do in my daily life meditation, movement, song, dance into this space. I'm not entirely sure how yet, but this is how I'm starting. Okay, wait, I have to stand up and dance. Okay, I don't have a, I want to really want a playlist. Ba, 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 da, ba, da. This, okay, this is to like release all that pain that we were just holding. If you're watching me right now, I highly recommend putting your phone down and just like shaking your arms out or whatever. Or if you want to get up and dance with me, that's great. Um, and I would really love to uh, have a playlist of royalty-free music, probably from TikTok artists. Um, so that way we can incorporate like a fun 10 minute dance party into these sessions. Um, alrighty. Finally, now we can get into today's reading. Okay. All right. And then I wrote, I've never written anything out for this channel before, but I'm really loving the intentionality. 
<sighs> and that's really true. All right, so we always start our first readings with, also it's really nice that I have a sticky note here that I can't see my face. So maybe I'll just start doing this more often. Um, okay. This is the Sass Tarot deck. Um, it's important to acknowledge the pain. Otherwise it just sits there and it cramps us up and it hurts and then our body hurts and our spirits hurts and our soul hurts. And we have to release it. It's supposed to flow. Money, space, time, energy, pain, pleasure. It's supposed to flow. Water, water, air. It's supposed to flow. Anyway, thank you, Catherine, for prompting that. This is the Sass Tarot deck. I made it with my friend Katie from high school. Um, and we created it together last year, and it's really, really cool. And um, kind of as a way of just like shouting the message to us. And so, Spirit, Holy Spirit, I ask, what is the message? for today, our final reading before I go into my break, so that way I can transition into the next chapter of my life. What, oh, these, okay. Anything else that you'd like to, oh, this one, okay. Um, yeah, anyway, we created this. Uh, so that way, I was like trying to teach myself tarot and, uh, th but I have the prototype, <laughs> the real one is different. It's got the, I kept texting Katie being like, what does this card, what's this one, what's this one? And so finally they were like, just put all the labels on the bottom of the card. All right, so the message that we got for today is, you gotta listen to your innards, trust that gut. You got a safety net, security, everyone needs that. Guys, I have spent the last two years trying to avoid homelessness, two, three years trying to avoid homelessness. And when I realized that I needed to move, five different friends in Portland offered me a room and opened up their homes to me. So I went from trying to avoid homelessness to like literally every home in the world. Um, and that's pretty stunning. You got a safety net security. And I mean, not literally every, but that's how it felt when like all the home offers came in within like the first three or four days. And I was just like stunned and bawling in my room because I didn't know what to do. Cause I was just like shocked, <laughs> shocked that these people saw me and wanted to care for me more and like these people that I've met in Portland my wonderful beautiful queer neuro queer queer fey people have provided so much more love and care for me in four months than my entire family has in like 28 years so they're my safety net my beautiful queer people are my safety net we all go through some shit okay sometimes it changes you this is so true we're not supposed to be the same person hopefully we can just grow to be better persons of ourselves that is very accurate um i'm not my i don't mind my hey lee stop <laughs> uh i don't mind going through i mean i actually hate dealing with shit but i i yeah i, just think, I uh, i'm not a dog uh, so much, just, okay, sorry. It's I love pets. I cannot stand cleaning up after them. It's just, I, yeah. <sighs> There's magic all around. Just look at the sky or a tree or some shit. That's very true. The magic is in nature. It's in the air. It's in the plants. It's in the water. Life's like walking a tightrope. Can't fall to either side. Wake up your goddamn mind, folks. And that is the energy that we got going into this. Oh my God. Thank you, Spirit. Wow, that was good. Oh, that was exciting. Okay, that was really fun. I need your energy with me. It makes it so much better. I am so stale and dry on my own. Um, it's true. I love you guys. I need I need you in my life. Um, all right. So in the concept of spirit, you know, this is, I'm just being me here. I love reading. I love song and dance. I love faith. I love spirituality. Um, and we got the Nag Hammadi scriptures. Uh, this is text from the old uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And we are reading from the book of Thomas. Okay, we, okay, my thumb came here, which was on this page, which is from the passage of wisdom and foolishness. But it's also kind of like right before this one that says our own and the others. Does anyone want to take a vote on which one we read while I take a sip of water? Let's see if anyone comes in with an answer. Also, I wonder how long the tap chat takes to come through. Uh oh, am I just gonna have to decide on my own? All right, I think I'm gonna go with wisdom and foolishness. The Savior continued. This is from the book of Thomas. Um, Doubting Thomas, I believe, is the text, is the scripture. It's one of my favorite ones. What are the options again? Wisdom and foolishness. And the second option is our own and the others. But I like the first sentence from Wisdom and Foolishness more. 
I'm gonna go with that one. Sounds great. I don't know. It's if we come, yeah. Okay. If we come in. I mean, I can read both. I, I can be here all night. I just have more cleaning to do. Always more cleaning to do. Wisdom and foolishness. Thank you, Haley. The savior continued and said, "Oh, unsearchable love of light." Oh, bitterness of the fire, you blaze in the body of people and in the marrow of their bones, blazing in them night and day, burning their limbs and making their minds drunk and their souls deranged. You dominate males and females day and night. You move and arouse them secretly and visibly. When the males are aroused, they are attracted to the females and the females to the males. That is why it is said that everyone who seeks truth from true wisdom will fashion wings to fly. Ah, oh, I love that. That is why it is said that everyone who seeks truth from true wisdom will fashion wings to fly, fleeing from the passion that burns human spirits. And one will fashion wings to flee from every visible spirit. Interesting. Okay, I want to come back to that. Thomas answered and said, Master, this is precisely what I ask you, since I understand that you are beneficial to us through what you say. Again, the Savior answered and said, this is why we must speak to you, because this is the teaching for the perfect. If you wish to become perfect, keep these sayings. If not, that's funny that it says, if you wish to become perfect, keep these sayings. And these were the sayings, that's fire. These were the sayings that were like locked up in the scrolls tucked away that weren't released or found, I think until 1945. I think I put the Wikipedia link in the description. Um, but, oh, crap, she wants to come in. Um, yeah, but if you wish to become perfect, keep these sayings. And then we threw out the sayings and like, guys, look at where humanity is. We are far from perfect, you know? Like, so that's just crazy to see that. Um, come here, Brooks. Maybe. Okay. Um, so that's just crazy to read that now. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Um, if not, the name for you is ignorant. Holy mackerel, you guys, that is insane. Since an intelligent person cannot associate with a fool, the intelligent perfect person is perfect in all wisdom, but to the fool, good and evil are the same. Wow, does that describe homophobia? The wise person will be nourished by truth and will be like a tree growing by the stream of water. Some people have wings, but rush towards visible things that are far from truth. The fire that guides them gives them an illusion of truth. It will shine on them with a perishable beauty and it will imprison them in dark delight and capture them in sweet smelling pleasure. Holy mackerel, you guys, I could just spend an hour alone talking about this. Um, and it will make them blind with insatiable desire, inflame their souls, and be like a stake that is jammed into their heart and can never be removed. Like a bit in the mouth, it leads them according to its own wish. It has bound them in its chains and tied all their limbs with the bitterness of the bondage for desire for those visible things that perish and change and fluctuate impulsively. They have always been drawn downward. When they are slain, they are drawn to all the animals of corruption. Thomas answered and said, It is clear and has been said that many are... Those who do not, do not know soul. Okay, so it looks like some text is missing there. Interesting. It is clear and has been said that those who do not know soul. It's not clear and it has not been said. Okay, so again, the Savior answered this is way. Interesting. I, I really do want to take a bunch of time to like go back and read all that. And maybe I'll just go re-examine it later. But we got to keep moving on because time is precious, folks, you know? See? Meow of confirmation. Um, it is clear and has and the Savior answered and said, Blessed is the wise people who has sought truth, and when it has been found, has rested upon it forever, and has not been afraid of those who wish to trouble him. So basically, too long didn't read. Blessed is the wise person who has sought for truth. And what has been found has rested on this truth forever and has not been afraid of those who wish to trouble him. You know what that reminds me of? Of just finally deciding to stay secure in your sexuality. For me, most of my journey was spent hating myself because I wanted to love and be with women. Um, and I had been raised to believe that that was like the most abhorrent thing that a person could do. And so I spent years battling it in myself, debating it in myself, fighting myself. And finally, ultimately, just like I literally would go out into the forest and scream to God, to spirit, to the universe and be like, look, if you are supposed to be a force of unconditional love, that I am just going to go out and just be my wild, nasty self and expect you 
and and recognize that you are going to love me anyway. And spirit, it felt like was like, yes, that is the point, babe. But we're not supposed to harm ourselves. We're not supposed to harm others. So we're supposed to find that delicate line. Um, but then it says here of resting on that truth. So finding that truth within ourself and being secure in it within ourself and resting on it within ourself. And and not being afraid of those who want to trouble you. So like not like like recognizing that those who want to spit hate at you or tell you that you're damned or doomed or or whatever that that is foolish. They do not know the difference between good and evil. So, I'm glad that that's what we read. That was really really important. Really significant. So, thank you for <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with me um, and while we read all that. So next, the next reading is Parable of the Sower, which is similar um, along the veins. If you've been hanging out with me so far, you're aware of the story, but let me just give you a quick recap. The story follows Lauren. She's a 15-year-old girl living in 2025 right outside LA. Um, she, the, the whole world has like succumbed to just wealth, inequality, pain, violence. Water is super, super scarce. Food car costs are ridiculous. Homelessness is rampant. Pain, violence, like people are just like dead in the streets all the time. Um, it's been pretty graphic so far. Honestly, if I knew that this book was this graphic before I started it, I would not have read it, um, which is probably why I didn't receive that information until I was too deep. Um, Cause I can't stop now folks. Um, I mean, me, no, I can't. We'd have to push through. Um, so anyway, so that's the story. The, in the beginning of getting so far, the first, like, probably this much was just setting the scene of what I described to you. And then in about this much right here, we've kind of learned that Lauren has been writing these books of channeled messages that she feels like she's receiving from the universe or from God. Um, and she tried to convince her friend that it was important to, like, create survival packets so that way if they had to run away or to survive in the wilderness, they could. And her family kind of rebelled and like just kind of said no it's not allowed and her dad really also was like no not allowed so that is where we are so far in the story we are in chapter eight to get along with god consider the consequences of your behavior fascinating earth seed the books of the living saturday july 26 2025 Tracy Dunn has not come home and has not been found by the police oh Tracy Dunn was the mother of a little seven-year-old girl who was shot in a previous chapter I don't think she will be. She's only been gone for a week, but a week outside must be like a week in hell. People vanish outside. They go through our gate like Mr. Yanis did, and everyone waits for them, but they never come back, or they come back in an urn. I think Tracy Dunn is dead. Bianca Manotoya is pregnant. It isn't just gossip. It's true, and it matters to me somehow. Bianca is 17, unmarried and out of her mind about George Iturb, who lives in the Ibarra house and is Yolanda Ibarra's brother. George admits to being the father. I don't know why they didn't just get married before everything got so public. George is 23, and he at least ought to have some sense. Anyway, they're going to get married now. The Ibarra and Iturb families have been feuding with the Montoyas for a week over this. So stupid. You'd think they had nothing else to do. At least they're both Latino. No interracial feud this time. Last year, when Craig Dunn, who's white and one of the saner members of the Dunn family, was caught making love to Sadie Moss, who's black, and Richard Moss's oldest daughter, Boot, I thought someone was going to get killed. Crazy. But my point isn't who's sleeping with whom or who's feuding. My point is, my question is, how in the world can anyone get married and make babies with the way things are now? Uh, I don't understand. We have so many children, orphaned and uh, children, like we have we have more than enough on the planet in every regard of houses for people we have people we have homes for people we have people to love people we just all got to get it together you know um i mean i know people have always gotten married and had kids but now now there's nowhere to go nothing to do a couple gets married and if they're lucky they get a room or a garage to live in with no hope of anything better and every reason to expect things to get worse Bianca's chosen life is one of my options, and it's not that I intend to exercise, it's not one that I intend to exercise, but it is pretty much what the neighborhood expects of me, of anyone my age. Grow up a little more, get married, have babies. Curtis Tolcott says that the new Iturb family will get a half, will get half a garage to live in after they marry George's sister Celia Urteb Cruz, and her husband and baby the other half. Two couple, two couples, and not one paying job among them. 
This is really painting a picture, isn't it? The best they could hope for would be to move into some rich people's compound as domestic servants and work for room and board. There's no way to save any money or ever do any better. And what if they wanted to go north, try for a better life in Oregon or Washington or Canada? It would be much harder to travel with a baby or two and much more dangerous to try to sneak past hostile guards and over state lines or international borders with babies. I don't know whether Bianca is brave or stupid. She and her sister are busy altering their mother's old wedding dress, and everyone's cooking and getting ready for a party as though these were the good old days. How can they? I like Curtis Talcott a lot. Maybe I love him. Sometimes I think I do. He says he loves me. But if all I had to look forward to was marriage to him and babies and poverty, that just keeps getting worse. I think I'd kill myself. Baby, you want to come here? Come here. Yeah, jump up. Oof. Oh. Saturday, August 2nd, 2025. We had a target practice today. And for the first time since I killed the dog, we found another corpse. We saw all this time, an old woman, naked, maggoty, half-eaten, and beyond disgusting. That did it for our Amos. She says she won't do any more target shooting. Not ever. Sorry, there we go. I tried talking to her, but she says it's the men's job to protect us anyway. She says women shouldn't have to practice with guns. What if you have to protect your younger sisters and brothers, I asked her. She has to babysit them often enough. I already know enough to do that, she said. You get rusty without practice, I said. I'm not going out again, she insisted. It's none of your business. I don't have to go. I couldn't move her. She was afraid, and that made her defensive. Dad said I should have waited until the memory of the corpse faded and then tried to convince her. He's right, I guess. It's the Moss attitude that gets me. Richard Moss lets his wives and his daughter pull things like this. He works them like slaves in his gardens and rabbit raising operation and around the house, but he lets them pretend they're ladies when it comes to any community effort. If they don't want to do their part, he always backs them up. This is dangerous and stupid. It's a breeding ground for resentment. No Moss woman has ever stood a watch. I'm not the only one who's noticed. The two oldest pain women kids went with us for the first time. Bad luck for them. They weren't scared off, though. Doyle and Margaret, that's the toughness to them. They're all right. Their uncle Wardle Parrish hadn't wanted them to go. He made nasty comments about dad's ego, about private armies and village gelantes, and about his taxes. Now he had paid enough in his life to have a right to depend on the police to protect him. Blah, blah, blah. He's a strange, solitary, whiny man. I've heard that he used to be wealthy. Dad agrees with me that he can't be trusted, but he's not Doyle and Margaret's father, and their mother, Rosalie Payne, doesn't like anyone telling her how to raise her five kids. Sleep well, Catherine. I hope you wake up and you feel really, really good and rested and rejuvenated. And to anyone who's going to sleep after this, I hope you wake everyone who goes to sleep tonight, I guess, I hope you wake up feeling rested and rejuvenated. Sleep well. Um... Okay. I heard that he used to be wealthy. Dad agrees with me that he can't be trusted. But he's not Doyle and Margaret's father. And their mother, mother, Rosalie Payne, doesn't like anyone telling her how to raise her five kids. The only power she has in the world is her authority over her children and her money. She does have a little money, inherited from her parents. Her brother has somehow lost his. So trying to tell her what to do or what he shouldn't let her kids do was a dumb move. I should have known better, though for the kid's sake, I'm glad he didn't. My brother Keith begged to go with us as usual. He'll turn, he'll, he'll turn 13 in a few days, August 14th. And the thought of waiting two more years until he's 15 must seem impossible to him. Oh, sorry, he'll turn 13 in a few days. So the thought of waiting until he's 15 must seem impossible to him. I understand that. Waiting is terrible. Waiting to be older is worse than other kinds of waiting because there's nothing you can do to make it happen faster. Poor Keith. Poor me. At least dad lets Keith shoot at birds and squirrels with the family BB gun, but Keith still complains. It's not fair, he said today for the 20th or 13th time. Lauren's a girl and you let her go. You always let her do things. I could learn to help you guard and scare off robbers. He had once made the mistake of offering to help shoot robbers instead of scaring them off. And dad all but preached him a sermon. Dad almost never hits us, but he can be very scary without lifting a finger. Oh, it's just scary. Keith didn't go today, of course, and our practice went all right until we found the corpse. We didn't see any dogs this time, 
Most upsetting to me, though, there were a few more rag, stick, cardboard, and palm frond shacks along the way into the hills along River Street. There always seemed to be none. They've never bothered us beyond begging and cursing, but they always stare so. It gets harder to ride past them. They're living skeletons, some of them. Skin and bones and a few teeth. They eat whatever they can find up there. Sometimes I dream about the way they stare at us. Back at home, my brother Keith slipped out of the neighborhood, out through the front gates, and away. He stole Corey's key and took off on his own. Dad and I didn't know until we got home. Keith was still gone, and by then, Corey knew he must be outside. He had checked with others in the neighborhood, and two of the Dunn kids, twins Allison and Marie, age six, said they saw him go out the gate. That was when Corey went home and discovered that her key was gone. Dad, tired and angry and scared, was to go right back out to look for him, but Keith just got home as Dad was leaving. Corey, Marcus, and I had gone out to the front porch with Dad, all three of us speculating about where Keith had gone, and Marcus and I volunteering to go with Dad to help search. It was almost dark. You get back in that house and stay there, Dad said. It's bad enough to have one of you out there. He checked the sub submachine gun, made sure it was fully loaded. Dad, look, I said. I had spotted something moving three houses down, quick, shadowy movement alongside the guardfield porch. I didn't know it was Keith. I was attracted by its fur fu fu furtiveness. Furtiveness? Furtiveness. Okay. Someone was sneaking around, trying to hide. Dad was quick enough to see the movement before it was hidden by the Garfield house. He got up at once, took the gun, and went to check. The rest of us watched and waited. Moments later, Corey said she heard an odd noise in the house. I was too focused on Dad and what was going on outside to hear what she heard, or to pay any attention to her. She went in. She went in. Marcus and I were still on the porch when she screamed. Marcus and I glanced at her and then at the front door. Marcus lunged for the door. I yelled for Dad. Dad was out of sight, but I heard him answer my call. Come quick, I shouted, then I ran into the house. Corey, Marcus, Bennett, and Gregory were in the kitchen, clustered around Keith. Keith was sprawled, panting, on the floor, wearing only his underpants. He was scraped and bruised, bleeding and filthy. Corey knelt beside him, examining him, questioning him, crying. What happened to you? Who did this? Why did you go outside? Where are your clothes? What? Where's the key you stole? Dad cut in. Did they take it from you? Everyone jumped, looked at Dad, then down at Keith. I couldn't help it, Keith said, still panting. I, I couldn't, Daddy. There was five guys. So they got the key. Keith nodded, careful not to meet Dad's eyes. Dad turned and strode out of the house, almost at a run. It was too late now to get George or Brian Hasu to change the gate lock. That would have to be done tomorrow, and new keys made and passed out. I thought Dad must be going out to warn people and to put more watchers on duty. I wanted to offer to help alert people, but I didn't. Dad looked too angry to accept help from one of his kids right then. And when he got back, Keith was in for it. Was he ever in for it? A pair of pants gone, a, share, a shirt, and a pair of shoes. Corey had never been willing to let us run around barefoot the way a lot of kids did, except in the house. Her definitions of being civilized did not involve dirty, heavily calloused feet any more than they involved dirty, diseased skin. Shoes were expensive, and we were always growing out of ours, but Corey insisted. Each of us had at least one pair of wearable shoes in spite of what they cost, and they cost a lot. Now, money would have to be found to get an extra pair for Keith. Keith curled up on the floor, smudging the tile with blood from his nose and mouth, hugging himself and crying now that Dad was gone. It took Corey two or three minutes to get him up and half carry him to the bathroom. I tried to help her, but she stared at me like I was the one who beat him up, so I let them alone. It wasn't as though I wanted to help. I just thought I should. Keith was in real pain, and it was too hard for me to endure sharing it. I cleaned up the blood so no one would slip in it or track it around. Then I fixed dinner, ate, fed the three younger boys, and put the rest aside for Dad, Corey, and Keith. Sunday, August 3rd, 2025. Keith had to confess that he had done this morning. Keith had to confess what he had done this morning at church. He had to stand up in front of the whole congregation and tell them everything, including what the five thugs had done to him. Then he had to apologize to God, to his parents, and to the congregation that he had endangered and inconvenienced. Dad made him do that over Corey's objections. Interesting. Dad never hit him, though last night he must have been tempted. Why would you do such a thing? He kept demanding. How could any set of minds be so stupid? Where are your brains, boy? What did you think you were doing? I'm talking to you. Answer me. Dad and Keith answered and answered and answered, but the answers never seemed to make much sense to Dad. I ain't no baby no more, he wept. Or, I wanted to show you. I just wanted to show you. You always let Lauren do stuff. Or, I'm a man. I shouldn't be hiding in the house, hiding in the wall. I'm a man. It went on and on because Keith refused to admit he had done anything wrong. 
He wanted to show he was a man, not a scared girl. It wasn't his fault that a gang of guys jumped him, beat him, robbed him. He didn't do anything. It wasn't his fault. Dad stared at him in utter disgust. You disobeyed, he said. You stole. You endangered the lives and the property of everyone here, including your mother, your sister, and your little brothers. If you were the man you think you are, I'd beat the hell out of you. He stared straight ahead. Bad guys come in even if they don't have a key, he muttered. They come in and steal stuff. It's not my fault. It took Dad two hours to get Keith to admit that it was his fault. No excuses. He'd done wrong. He wouldn't do it again. My brother isn't very smart, but he makes up for it in pure stubbornness. My father is smart and stubborn. Keith didn't have a chance, but he made Dad work for his victory. The next morning, Dad had his revenge. I don't believe he thought of Keith's forced confession that way, but Keith's expression told me that he did. How do I get out of this family? Marcus muttered to me as we watched. I sympathized. He had to share a room with Keith, and the two of them, only a year in age, only a year apart in age, fought all the time. Now things would be worse. Keith is Corey's favorite. If you asked her, she would say she didn't have a favorite, but she does. She babies him and lets him get away with skipping chores, a little lying, a little stealing. Maybe that's why Keith thinks when he screws up, it's okay. This morning's sermon was on the Ten Commandments with extra emphasis on honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt not steal. I think Dad got rid of a lot of anger and frustration preaching that sermon. Keith, tall, stone-faced, looking older than his 13 ears, kept his anger. I could see him keeping it inside, holding it down, choking on it. Mm. Mm. That was an interesting chapter. Different than, different than the initial ones. Makes me wonder how the book is going to change and evolve with time. There's a sequel to it. There's also a sequel to it. I don't know... I don't know if we're going to read it here or if I'll read it on my Patreon channel, but we'll decide that in the future. Um, I could see him keeping it inside, holding it down, choking on it. Emotions are another thing that's supposed to flow. They're not a thing that you're supposed to keep inside and hold in tight. Um, and also the, that last paragraph where this pastor like had an issue in the home and preached about it it reminded me of growing up of going to church and one of my loved ones turning to me uh after sermons usually about the prodigal son um or similar things about anger or uh lack of self-control or um I don't know just anything that they thought really applied to me they would turn to me at the end of the sermons and be like aren't you so glad you were listening to that? It applies to you directly. And I'd be like, what the fuck? I'm 12 years old. <laughs> so that's crazy. Um, and wrong. And I recognize that, but I'm sure that there are preachers, kids who literally dealt with their past, with their parents, probably their father, um, shaming them in front of the entire congregation. And if that happened to you, I just want to say that I'm really sorry. And I see you. And that shouldn't have happened to you. And you deserve way better than that. Okay. We are ending with, so normally I try to do these in the beginning of the day because like anger is another emotion and it fires me up. It like inspires me to like do the things to do the things and not just like lay in my bed and watch TikTok all day, which is what I want to be doing. Um, and so this is the book Killing the Planet. Um, oh, I wrote today when I was talking about it. Okay. I wrote, I wrote, look. I may look back and regret this decision to read this book out loud. I, I just, I spent some time today looking into the authors and the publishing company and I don't agree with anything else really that they've said. Um, but when I read this book before in 2019, it felt like reading an encyclopedia or like a, not a bibliography, maybe a bibliography, a reference list. It felt like reading a reference list with like, like in, in chronological order of how we got to where we are today. So it, it's literally just names, dates, people, what they did. And it's basically just history. It's it's how a financial cartel doomed mankind. Um, and, and I believe that all of our actions are going towards good somehow, eventually, if that is our intention. You know, God makes all things good. There's, I think, the Bible phrase or something like that that says something like that. Um, and I just have to trust that it'll all be okay. And I feel pretty confident Um in the story because it's history and when I first read it it made me so viscerally angry that um 
I had to like stop reading it or like throw it across the room. And it just made me want to take the steps to change my life. So that way we didn't repeat this in the future. Um, we are on page seven of snake oil. It started with the ancestors of the Rockefeller family and kind of how they got started. Um, and so we're now reading the paragraph of Drake's Folly. A new commodity arising from the farming backwoods of Western Pennsylvania now attracted John D.'s attention. Colonel Edwin Drake, who was not really a colonel, erected a tall wooden structure known as a derrick and began drilling for oil with equipment used in salt wells. His notion of drilling for oil made him the laughingstock of the small town Titsville. But the laughter stopped on August 28, 1859, when oil began to gush from the ground and to fill the pails that Drake had placed within the derrick. A whole new industry was born overnight. Drake proved that through drilling, oil could be found in abundance and produced cheaply. Before 1850, oil was not a precious commodity. Quacks like David Bill, hmm, I don't know if I like the word quacks. I don't think we should call people names. People like David Bill used it, maybe in quakes? No, that does, quake says it, it's a K-E, I think. This is Q-U-A-C-K-S, that's quacks, right? Like a a silly person. Like David Bill used to treat a variety of diseases, including consumption and diphtheria and paraffin. Developed in 1830, was used to make candles and to lubricate machinery. Kerosene was invented by Dr. Abraham Gessner in 1848 by distilling coal and to produce a clear fluid. But this method of making kerosene was expensive and kept kerosene lamps from use in average households. In 1853, a new method of producing kerosene was discovered by washing crude oil with sulfuric acid. The possibility now loomed that... <laughs> Sorry, I just thought of something. Not related. The possibility now loomed that oil could be used to lamp the lights of the world. But the end of the decade, thanks to Drake's folly, the oil rush began. We could have listened to Nestle. So, okay, so this book follows, I think, I don't think Thomas Edison is in this book. But this book follows um, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, the founder of Chase, a couple of people. Um, we could have free electricity. We could be running off of free electricity right now, but we recognize what happened with Nikola Tesla and somehow we ended up in whatever timeline we are in. So this is the history of how we got to the timeline that we're in right now. I think we're building a better timeline. I think that there's enough people working on creating a beautiful, bright future that we're going to be okay and we're going to make it. That's my personal belief. At least I'm holding on to it. I've had the vision. I feel like I know I have. I know I have. I know I know that this world is beautiful and I know it's going to work out. Um, visualize a shield of protection, folks. This is the energy. This is the mood of the moment. Protect yourself from toxic people or situations. Imagine a shield of white light. Oh my God, I do that all the time. Well, of course, it's a very common practice. But imagine a shield of white light surrounding your body. This keeps negativity out and lets positive energy in. Um, all right. Let's do a real reading. Um, and reclaim your power was at the bottom of the deck. Do not give your power away to anyone. Say to yourself, I am strong and capable. I can approach this situation with confidence and skill. You can also like do a reclaim your power back intentionality setting. I call back all my power from all people, places, and things that are using it without my consent or permission. Um, it's back to me now. Um yeah, there's a lot of things you could do. I, I want to talk about so much on my YouTube channel. I don't know what, how, what order to do it in. I have a little bit of an idea, but not really. And I think after I move, I'm going to like create a deck with all of my special interests in it. And then just kind of like pop off with random three minute rants. Um, and see what traction we get, you know, see what special interests people want to hear my spill out of my brain. Um, cause it'll be good. All right. So we're just pulling up some, uh, some ways to like love ourselves, get some boundary setting. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a break. I'm moving. I was watching a friend's dog house sitting here in Washington. I live in Oregon and I'm moving to another place. Um, so my goal is to be back here by November 3rd to be out of my current place and moved into the other place by November, by the 31st, by the 30th is actually my goal. And then it's Halloween. It's my, Halloween is my favorite holiday. It doesn't feel like Halloween for me. So 
next year we'll just like celebrate really hardcore and in double and I'll just make the whole month about Halloween. It'll be fantastic. Um, but for now, I guess I'm just going to say happy Halloween. I don't even have a piece of candy to offer you. Sorry about that. Um, and I just hope you have a really safe season. So any other form of self-love um, or boundary setting that we want before we close out? Oh my God, everything? Okay, I mean, it's important to do a lot of things. We did that already. All right, folks. I'm just going to blast these at you real fast. Visualize a shield of protection. Energize yourself with earthing. Meditate in the spaciousness of air. Tame negative thinking. Set limits with draining people and make peace with uncertainty. Uncertainty is really, really hard, especially those for autism. This, that's why autism is very challenging because uncertainty like fires everything up in the worst way possible. Um, so those are all really good things. And then the ones that we did pull initially is be lighthearted. Set your intention to be easygoing and playful today. Gift yourself with some carefree time to have fun. And oh, I love the rainbow. <laughs> Energize yourself with the weather. Enjoy the warm sunshine, the wind in the trees, the cleansing rain, or the clarity after a snowstorm. This will increase your aliveness. And finally, practice humility. Approach life humbly. No one is better than another. Keep your ego in check. Humility is the practice of being simple and valuing simple things. All right, folks. So if you made it here this far with me, thanks for hanging out with me. That's yeah, pretty special. We got an eclipse coming up. Um, so energy is going to be pretty chaotic and apparently it's a pretty intense one. I don't really fully understand all of it, but what little I do understand, just ground yourself, meditate, let it flow. We're all going to get through this together. It's going to be great. Um, while we are being lighthearted, practicing it, loving our inner child, sitting with our inner child, having fun. It's also important to be outside. You know, that's where spirit is. Spirits in the water, in the air, in the ground in the fire and recognize that the ability to have a life of ease where you can just sit outside and enjoy yourself for a moment is truly bliss in the state of our world that we have right now. So that is what I got for you. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Um, I didn't write any of this down, but I guess I'm just going to say it if you've made it this far. I need help in any way you want to offer it. Uh, financial help, cheering me on, emotional help, support. Um, if you've made it, if you, if, if you're going back, if you decide to go back and binge Untamed or Queer Magic and you want to leave me a timestamp comment so that way this just goes to anyone, I will go back and I'll put it in the description. You'll just save me the time, energy, and effort of me going back in and, and doing the back work. I'm also still creating show notes for queer magic. Uh, I didn't want to push off moving forward by letting the paperwork hold me back. So I'm just slowly getting that done. And then I'll just put it all in there when it's done. And I'll let you guys know when that happens. Um, and I guess I'm going to just be honest and come out and say it. Man, that was really hard to say. Um, I think I consider myself a lifelong missionary for queer people, like a conduit between queer people and evangelical Republicans who want to tear us down. So I'm fighting to create a world where we don't have to fight, where we can just live in bliss and ease. If you are in a position that you are currently in bliss and ease and you are able to share some of that with me, some stability, there's lots of ways that you can do that. I have a Patreon account after I get moved. Like I'm just doing, I've been doing this full time since May now. I don't have an income. I've, you know, that's, it's starving artist, but Hey, this is who I am and what I've always wanted. Um, and so, you know, I'm just really, I'm really grateful because I'm moving into a place where I have very limited expenditures and hi baby. Um, and I'm just going to be working hard on this. I'm going to be working hard on trying to find some financial stability on my own. I don't think corporate America job is for me. I've been really burnt out from trying to explain autism to corporate and assist neurotypical employers. So if I can find a great job with some cool neuroqueer company, that would be amazing. I don't know what the future has on hold for me. I'm just really grateful that I get to experience it. So thank you so much for hanging out with me. I really enjoyed, 
I really enjoyed today. I really enjoyed reading and setting all that up. I enjoyed not seeing my face. That was that was bliss. So I think we're going to be doing that in the future. Oh, we got to do a spinal roll. You know what? I don't want to. We're just going to float up today. Let's just give ourselves a big hug. It's nighttime. We're going to go to bed soon. I love you. I hope you take care. I will see you soon. I hope you wake up feeling rested and rejuvenated and ready to take on your day. You are amazing and powerful and brave and strong and courageous. You belong. You are worthy. You are created with a bright, beautiful light to share with the world. Keep creating. Keep putting yourself out there. Keep making beautiful art. And we will see each other soon. We'll see each other soon. Take care.